Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. It's amazing what God has already been doing here today. And just, you know, it's a miracle uh, that you're here. Amen. And we pray God's blessing be upon you and your family as God continues to change lives. Uh, everything we do and, and uh, is really all about him and it's all about the people of God. Amen. So, again, I count it as an honor. I count it as a privilege that I get a chance to uh, preach to you in English today. I always, often always preach in Spanish. I do speak English, obviously. Amen. But I have the honor to speak in Spanish to the Spanish congregation. So today you get a, a treat. I hope it's a treat. Amen. And I pray the word of God really blesses your life. Amen. So how many say amen? Amen. amen. So Daniel chapter 2, verse 26 through verse 30. The book of Daniel the prophet. Chapter 2, verses 26 and 30. Amen. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. And it reads, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered, In the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven. How many gave him praise? There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head. Upon your bed were these. As you, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes, who's, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your hearts. Amen. See, in the world, in a world where empires, obviously through history, rise and fall, nations shift powers, we often ask ourselves, what is the true foundation that will sustain my life again we are probably a week away from a major election in this country and I'm never going to tell you who to vote for but I would just say search your heart and know that every nation will always be judged according to who leads it and what they believe so we are weeks away and I just implore that you seek God and guidance and the importance of this election that will define our world, heart and morale of the nation for the next coming years. Enough said on that. Now chapter 2 of the book of Daniel presents us with a fascinating vision, a dream from a king, this king called Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that reveals not only the destiny of the earthly kingdoms, but also the unbreakable sovereignty of our God. Can I just simply say, our God reigns. Our God is king forevermore. And if you believe that, give him a praise. Now, amid the confusion and the uncertainty, God offers us an eternal sovereign God. He offers us a rock, a rock upon which we can build on, a foundation upon which we can build our lives. Jesus spoke of the rock. He said, if you build your house on this rock, it will sustain every situation that you will ever face. But if you do not build upon the rock, it calls, he says, you will build on sand. And when the storms of life come, you will indeed fall. He's given us a rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. How many gave him praise? His rock, he's the rock that establishes a kingdom that will never be destroyed. 
So today we will explore how this last kingdom, amen, invites us to trust in the stability of his kingdom, no matter what's happening around us, no matter what's happening around the world, no matter what's happening with the nations of the world, I just want to tell you his kingdom reigns, his kingdom lasts, his kingdom is forever more and it will not be shaken, his kingdom, we ought to live with the certainty that despite all these circumstances, our hope is on the rock. Our hope is on Jesus, the rock that will never, ever, ever be moved. If your hope is in government, you're going to fall. If your hope is on a person, you're going to fall. If your hope is on a world system, you're going to fall. If your hope is on a political system, you're going to fall. But if your hope is on Jesus Christ, if your hope is on the eternal rock, oh, hallelujah. Today I will preach... An eschatology message, meaning the study of end times. I have already shared this message in the Spanish service several weeks ago. And I find it important to share that with the whole body of Revive. If you are taking notes, my message today, and hopefully I get to go through it, is the last empire, the eternal rock. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you because we stand before the Lord God Almighty, who we've praised and we've honored in this place. Father, I pray that you will help me preach this message today. That I will only say those things that will edify, build up your people, never tear them down. We ask you that your Holy Spirit will lead and we will always give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. How many say amen? You know, the future is something that has always intrigued us. What is going to happen? When is it going to happen? How to face tomorrow with more confidence? What kind of world will my children live in? When will the end be? Many say they have certain information about the future. Some naysayers, some sorcerers, some parapsychologists, some astrologers, And magicians maintain that they have the ability to tell us what's about to happen. And you know, I've often found in my walk with the Lord in over the years that I have ran into believers that sometimes put more hope and have more belief in the daily horoscope than what the Word of God says. They will look to see what the horoscope says, how my day is going to be today. And neglect to find out what the word of God says, how your wife is about to go today. Give the Lord a praise. I come from a background in my upbringing of spiritualism, witchcraft, auto worship. All these things were things I was exposed to as a child growing up. So I know a little bit of what I'm talking about today. You must know that Israel is the covenant people of our God and that Israel no matter what your political stance is on Israel the Bible shows me tells me that Israel is the prophetic clock of God you want to know what God's about to do you want to know what God has done in the past look to Israel it is God's clock it is God's prophetic clock not pathetic but prophetic clock. So let us share a brief timeline that would help you, put you today in the place I want us to be to then further understand the story or the image that I will preach about in the coming minutes. Let us share a brief timeline. Now we all are aware of Exodus, how the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. This occurred in history around 1,446 years before Christ. Later on, they were taken into the desert for 40 years and they were promised a land. It is called the promised land. It is called Canaan. And God, hallelujah, ushered them into Canaan around the beginning of the year 1406 before Christ. Christ. This is God, your God, the God you were and I worshiping a few minutes ago. 
And I will continue to say that about for six years this went on. The conquest of that land took around six years after they entered the land. So around the year 1406 to 1400 before Christ. Now the people of Israel conquered the promised land and settled the promised land during that time. Don't believe the false narrative that they took the land in the year 1947 when I can read that 1,446 years before Christ, God ushered them into the land. Give the Lord a praise. They settled it. Now after Moses who led them into the promised land, God raised up another leader. His name was Joshua, which means salvation. And the new leader ushered them into the land. Who famously was quoted, you and I are probably aware of this famous quote, during the end of his ministry or his life, when the people were already in the land, he stood before the people. And you remember this. He said, choose ye today who you will serve, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was Joshua who ushered them into the promised land. Now, for about 410 years, I said 410 years. Years. Let's put this in context. The United States is not even 410 years old. Just wrap your mind around that. But for 410 years, Israel was ruled by judges. If you read the Bible, it's called the book of Judges. Judges, the last judge in the Bible is called Prophet Samuel. It was Samuel who God sent into the house of Jesse to anoint David as king. That's the Samuel that I'm talking about. He was, in fact, the last judge. Then the people wanted a king. The people told God, we want to be like the rest of the nations in Canaan. We want to be like the rest of the nations around us. They all have a king. We have judges who lead us every now and then. When an emergency will come up, God will pull out or call a judge to lead the people, to fight for the people, to help the people. But God did not ever give them a king. God considered himself the king. So the people said, give me a king. So God gave them a king according to their heart. God gave them a king according to how they wanted to be like the rest of the nations. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like the rest. I want to be like what God wants us to be. Oh, give the Lord a praise. So God gave them the king called Saul as the king, the first king of Israel, ending the era of judges. Now Saul, the Bible teaches us. I'm going through the Bible quickly here. Saul, the Bible teaches us. He ended in disobedience and was judged by God because of his disobedience. God gave him specific instructions and he refused to obey God, to sanctify God before the people. God then moved quickly to find a replacement. And the Bible says he found a replacement in a young man called David. Yes, I'm talking about the David who slew the giant. God chose him. And throughout the history of David, can I just say this? David was never perfect. David was also often a sinner. David killed somebody, took somebody's wife, did a lot of wrong things, and yet God says, I chose him. I chose him. Keep that in mind when you go to vote for people because we often want to judge people according to how we don't want to be judged. And don't realize that God has a plan in whatever political affiliation you're in. He has a plan. Trust God. Trust his plan. He can use anyone for his glory. And at the end of the day, God chose David with all his flaws and he became king. And here's the thing. God said, I found a man according to my heart. What made David a man according to God's heart was not his perfection. What made him according to God's heart was that he always turned to God. He always ran to God. He always said, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. And God said, I like that from any man. I like that from any woman. I like that from any person that you will always turn to God. How many give him praise in this house? And David, the Bible says, became the king of Judah. And then later on, he became the king of Israel. I need you to understand this to be able to understand what I'm about to explain. So King David ruled from the year 1010 to the year 970 
before Christ. In other words, he reigned for 40 years. Now after King David, the one who reigned over the kingdom, became his own son. His name was Solomon. But Solomon reigned over the united kingdom of Israel. Pastor, what is that? Israel had a united kingdom during the reign of Saul, during the reign of David, and during the reign of Solomon. But something happened after Solomon died, the kingdom divided. And then we end up with what's called the northern, the northern kingdom, ten tribes, and the southern kingdom, two tribes. The kingdom of the north was called the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of the south was called the kingdom of Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Give God a praise in this house. I mean, the year, 7022. Pastor, I think I came today to study history. Yes, yeah, you did. In the year 722, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom. What kingdom was that? Israel. Due to their sin and their continued disobedience and their continued idolatry, worshiping false gods. The Bible, if you read it, teaches me that all the kingdoms of, oh, excuse me, all the kings of Israel were wicked. They all worship other pagan gods. I'm talking about Israel. All of them were wicked. So God delivered them into the hands of the Assyrians at the year 722. Now in the year 605 before Christ, I'm talking 117 years after Israel was taken captive. Israel was taken into exile. 117 years. The key here is Judah had revivals every so often. What made, excuse me, what made the difference between Judah and Israel was in Judah, there were revivals every so often. What is that, Pastor? Every so often a king would appear that would worship the true God, that would tear down the idols, that would submit the people to fast and to pray and to worship their God. And because of that, Judah lasted 117 years more than Israel. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, sir, from what we just finished reading in his dream, he was the king of the empire of Babylon. That conquered Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish people, and exiled them. The best and brightest of the king's descendants were taken into service in the court of the king. So picture this, 117 years after Israel, now Judah is conquered by what? The Assyrians know that already happened by Nebuchadnezzar. Who's Nebuchadnezzar? He is the kingdom of Babylon. They take now the Jewish, the Jews, the Judas, the Jewish through Judah, and the smartest people of the kingdom would be absorbed into the service of the king of Babylon. Did anybody get that? I didn't lose anybody, did I? Okay. There's, there's going to be a test at the end. Now, you were probably familiar, if you know a little bit of Bible, that some of these were well known. Daniel was one. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were the children of Judah, some of them that were taken into the service of the king. The Bible says the chief officer renamed them. They couldn't keep their Jewish names, so they gave them names from the kingdom of Babylon. And now you might recognize them. One was called Shadrach. One was called Misak. One was called Abednego. Do you remember the three Hebrew kids in the fiery furnace? How many remember that story? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. They were in exile. They were in Babylon. Let's go back to chapter 2 because i got to try to wrap this up quick. But in Daniel chapter 2, God challenges the soothsayers, the ones who think they know it all, the ones who say, we got the revelation. We can tell you and we can foretell the future. God reveals himself as the only one who knows the future. And in chapter 2 of Daniel, God clearly outlines history. Through this image of this statue and its explanation, he covers in one image two 1,500 years of history, exactly foreseeing the rise and fall of the world empires. It's impressive to assert how God, his ability to guide and be involved in the destiny of all nations. Can I just tell you, your God reigns. Your God is sovereign. 
He has the last word. How many say amen? amen? If he is wise enough to tell the future and powerful enough to orchestrate the rise and fall of nations, he can certainly guide my life today. I can certainly trust him with my daily walk. How many say amen? amen. Just to guide you, sir. We can all trust God. We can all trust his plans for us. We can trust in his word. Heaven and earth will pass, but his word will not pass. Jeremiah 29, 11, well-known scripture says, For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. How many say amen? amen. Now let's go back to King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar reigned from 605 to 562 before Christ. He reigned for 43 years in Babylon. Greatly expanding the Babylonian Empire. As I said before, conquering even Jerusalem. Deporting the Jews in the process. Daniel was one of those deported from Judah. Received an education in the king's courts. When God granted Daniel the wisdom to interpret the dream that the king had. He began his long career as a political leader, trusted advisor, and a recognized prophet. That's King Nebuchadnezzar, sir, and that's Daniel. Let's go to the dream. As we read Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. That night, an unusual dream disturbed King Nebuchadnezzar. Sir. The next morning, he summoned the magicians and enchanters to tell him what he had dreamed and give me the interpret. Picture this. He's got a dream. He knows it was disturbing. He knows it was significant. He just doesn't remember the dream. Not only does he not remember the dream, he don't remember what it was, what it means. So he calls his wise people of the kingdom. He calls the magicians, the naysayers, and all these people. And he tells them, hey, I got a challenge for you. Imagine this. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to tell me what I dream, and I need you to tell me what it means. Now, you know, Obviously, as you go on and read the Bible, they completely failed. Who can do that? I mean, obviously, who can do that? You know, it's easy if I am a fortune teller, I need you to give me some critical information so that I can then take a good guess and make you believe that I know your future. But that's called manipulation. That's called the spirit of witchcraft. Now, the, 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 the wise men, they completely failed. See, God, in a miraculous way, hit the dream from Nebuchadnezzar's mind so that he could not remember anything. If the king had told the dream, the magicians, the enchanters would be able to invent an interpretation that would be convincing. The wise men were considered the most brilliant minds in the kingdom. And they used tricks to deceive. Sort of like today. Magicians used tricks and enchantments. Astrologers observe the position of the stars as it means to try as a means to try to predict the future. Sorcerers and spiritualists say they communicate with the dead. The Chaldeans, the elite educated people of the Babylonian sciences, sought to reveal the future through mathematical calculations. The point is this: they all failed. They all failed. None of them was able to express what the dream was had been, and what was the interpretation. This angered the king. It's like saying, what do I pay you for? What is all this training I put you through? I put my hope and the leading of this kingdom on all you, all you people who, who tell future, and I'm asking you a simple task. Tell me the dream, and you, you cannot even do that. So the, the king was upset. He was angry, and he condemned all the wise men of Babylon Sentenced to death. Whoa. You either tell me the dream or you die. Imagine that. Tell me the dream or you die. Many times you are distressed looking for answers in your life. Maybe you're going through that today. We long to know what will happen in the future. How to be happy. How to have a better life. What about tomorrow? As in the days of Daniel, things are repeated today. These astrologers, these teachers, spiritualists, and many others who claim they have the power to lift the veil of the future, be it through cards, 
be it through stones, be it through new age. They are not capable of knowing the future by themselves. Only in God and in the word of God, the Bible, can we find the answers that we're looking for. We find the answers for the future. We find the answers for our happiness. We find the answers for our victory. We find the answers for our provision. We find the answers for our healing. We find the answer that will resolve all the questions in life. Because as we read the scriptures, we are quickly introduced to he who said, I am that I am. Give him praise in this house. Only God reveals the future. We read Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. As we saw the dream that disturbed Nebuchadnezzar. And he summoned all these people to help him. And many times, as I said, only God is the one who is able to reveal the dream. So in chapter 2 of Daniel, I got to move along. Daniel was the first to be sought by the government agents to be executed. Picture that. So now they're coming to kill Daniel. Why? Because Daniel, along with his friends, the wise people they chose from Judah, who are now in Babylon, who became members of the court of the king because of their wisdom, they're part of this group of people that are about to be killed. So he's being sought out. And only Daniel did not know what was happening. So he begged for a little time. As he consulted God. And I can read that in Daniel chapter 2 verse 16. Look what Daniel says. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time. That he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house. Made the decision known to Hananiah, Messiah, and Azariah. His three friends. You know them as Sadrach, Misak, and Abednego. His companions. That they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret. So that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. So Daniel blessed God of heaven. Oh my God. He seeked after God and God revealed. Here we begin to understand one of the keys that I hope you walk away with today. That opens the doors to solving any one of your issues or your problems. Prayer. <laughs> Pastor, what's the secret? Prayer. When you don't know anything else, seek him. Talk to him. Pray to him. Ask him. Look after him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall, will be added unto you. When you seek him, the Bible says if you knock on the door, he will open it. If you call, he will answer. And if you seek him, you will find him. How many say amen? amen. That's something we can quickly learn from the life of Daniel and his friends. Number two. God has the wisdom and the strength. See, God revealed in Nebuchadnezzar's dream the history of the empires of this world and what will be in the last days of earth. Nebuchadnezzar's dream points to the time of the end. I'm talking about now. I'm talking about in a few years from now or a few days or a few hours from now. It predicts the events that occur until the earth history is close. Let's look at the dream. The dream and the interpretation found in Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. And he reads and goes on and says, Daniel tells the king, you O king, you were watching and beheld a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver. Its belly and thighs were of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly iron, partly clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands. Which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like a chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away, said that no trace of them was ever found or was found. 
and here. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So glad you listened to our podcast. We're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, you will be so grateful. And you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. what he saw he saw an image King Nebuchadnezzar saw Daniel revealed it to him he said King you saw an image and he described it what's significant about the image is what's happening to the feet the feet which if I go on can just sum it up and tell you represents the end time it represents the final kingdoms of the world what I see happening to the final kingdoms of the world at the end time in the history that God showed King Nebuchadnezzar revealed through Daniel the prophet there's a stone that strikes the feet there's a stone that strikes the end time empires of the world can I just fast forward and tell you the stone that will never be moved his name is Jesus Christ Yes! Hallelujah! Daniel chapter 2 verse 36. Here's the interpretation. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king. He's talking to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. You, O king, are a great king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of man dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. That's his empire. And you, you're the head. You're the head of gold. But, verse 39. After you, Babylon, you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours than any other, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. And a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron the kingdom shall be divided yet the strength of iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay so the end time kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay they will mingle with the seed of man but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay because it's only a world alliance. And in the days of these kings, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountains, the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the kingdoms of the world, the great God has made it known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. In other words, count on it. You can count on his word. I say you can count on his word. If God said it, it's going to happen. If God revealed it, it's going to happen. This message today is an eschatology sermon, meaning end time sermon, but it's also a historical sermon. Because when Daniel received this revelation, the only empire 
that was in existence at the time was Babylon. You are the head. You are the go head, O king, Babylon. But after you, there's another kingdom. For 1,500 years of history. So let me wrap that up for you. Babylon, the head of gold. If you could put the image again. Babylon, the head of gold. From the year 605 to 539 before Christ. Gold is an appropriate symbol for Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon as an empire from 605 until 539. Located in what we all know today is called Iraq. 100 kilometers south of Baghdad was the capital city of this empire. And it became the center of the most powerful nation in the Middle East at the time. Their most important god, Bel Marduk, was made of solid gold. His golden image represented him sitting on a golden throne and from a golden table in a temple of golden dome. The prophet Isaiah, also called Babylon, the city of greedy gold in Isaiah 14. So however Babylon would not last forever, it would be defeated by another empire. Number two, the Medo Persian Empire. The year 539 to 331, represented in the statue as the silver chest and arms. The Medo Persian Empire defeated Babylon in the year 539 before Christ, with Cyrus the general who commanded the armies of the people appear predicted in the Bible by his own name don't have time to get into that but his name was predicted 150 years before it happened so it can be seen in Isaiah 44 in Isaiah 45 the metal Persian Empire ruled the region of the world from 539 until 331 before Christ but there came another empire number three the Greek Empire, represented in the image, the bronze belly and thighs, the year 331 through the year 168 before Christ. The nation of Greece defeated the Persian, metal Persian Empire. Greece ruled the world, the known world, from the year 331 until the year 168. Everybody knows who was led, who led this empire, who led this great army. Alexander the Great, at the age of 33 years, represented here by the bronze belly and the ties and the image that King Nebuchadnezzar saw. But then God revealed, if you put the image again, the fourth empire in the year 168 before Christ through the 476 after iron legs feet the Roman Empire the Roman conquered the Greeks in the year 168 before Christ the Roman Empire ruled the world during the time of Christ himself Caesar Augustus Roman Emperor was one who decreed that everyone would pay taxes. A Roman court tried Jesus. Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. See, the Babylonian Empire reigned for 66 years. The Middle Persian Empire reigned for 208 years. The Greek Empire reigned for 185 years. And the Roman Empire remained for another 500 plus years. It's interesting to me and we don't have time but Daniel saw the image had two legs during the Roman Empire do you know that the Roman Empire divided into two East and West empires the division of the Empire occurred in 351 AD through 476 AD no subsequent Empire defeated the Romans Rome was divided exactly as the prophet had predicted. Northern barbarian tribes invited the Roman Empire, invaded them, subsequently resulting in the division into separate states, nations that today you know as France, Germany, England, Spain, Italy, all the way down into the Middle East of nations that were part of the, what today is called the Islamic Caliphate. 
Islam. The feet seen on the image is the end time kingdom. It's a mixture of clay, mixture of iron. It represents human alliances before Jesus returns. Daniel chapter 2, 46, and I'm almost finished. Verse 46, read, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon who said if you're faithful to God you ain't going to get promoted, who said if you're faithful to God before the world that God won't bless you, who said you got to be like them they don't, you don't got to be like them they need to be seeking to be like you don't compromise we analyze the conclusion statue of gold silver bronze clay iron the representation of the glory and the power of human kingdoms so when we look at the image it represents the glory of the kingdoms from a human perspective but it also shows us how temporary they are reflect on these kingdoms our reflection of humanity because in the kingdoms we see a reflection of humanity. We see pride. We see ambition before the fall. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom of justice, righteousness, joy, peace, and the Holy Ghost. It is an eternal kingdom. Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This prophecy was fulfilled. What I want to focus on as I conclude is Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 again. And it reads, And in the days of these kings, let's put the statue, well, it's fine, leave the scripture. But in the days of these kings, the God of heaven, will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all the other kingdoms but this kingdom shall stand forever the kingdom of our Christ the kingdom of our Lord the kingdom of our God the kingdom of all my God will stand forever more because in the days of these kingdoms I'm sending down a rock that will smash these world empires. I'm sending down a rock that will do away with humanity's worship of themselves. And I will establish a kingdom that will never be moved. That is the kingdom of your God. That is the kingdom of our Lord. That is the kingdom of our Christ. The return of Jesus is the hope that is before us today. Christ is the stone that finally tore down the historical succession of world empires. If I go any deeper, I'll probably lose you. We can talk about the last caliphate. We can talk about Islam. We can talk about the Muslim, how they will be part of that alliance at the end. We're not going to go there today. Starting in January, to start having Bible studies on most some Wednesdays and I find it a, a responsibility to start teaching you some of these things on midweek services that we're going to have starting in January. Give the Lord a praise. First Corinthians 10.4 reads and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. The action of the rock that destroys the statue represents God's intervention 
in human history. Let me just say this as I wrap. Christ is returning. I said Christ is returning. But you need to understand his return is twofold. He's coming for the church first. Are you ready? The Bible says in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise and those that are alive will be transformed. The Bible says two will be plowing in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. The Bible says two will be in a bed, one will be left, one will be taken. That's called the rapture. That's called in a moment's instant, the trumpet will sound and we are going to be in his presence. If you made him your Lord. But seven years later, the Bible teaches me that then the rock that smashes the empires returns. Revelation 19, and I will end with this scripture. Verse 11. The Apostle John, writing from the island of Patmos, what he wrote was a revelation. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and his righteousness, his judges, and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on that one knew except himself. No one knew except himself. He was clothed with robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, that's you, that's me, after rapture, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of him will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself threads on the winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Verse 19, and I saw the beasts, that's the Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies, that alliance, those kingdoms that refused to accept to call, to welcome Jesus. You're not welcome here. We don't want to have nothing to do with you. We prefer to live this way. Those people will remain when Jesus returns. I'm here to tell you, you will either see him as the loving, merciful God that he is eternally, or you will see him as the righteous judge. I wish I could paint you another image today. I wish I could preach you another message today. I wish I could make you feel good today. But I need to let you know that just as the empires that God revealed to Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar, history tells me just as it was revealed, it happened. Then the next thing that will happen is Jesus coming back. Let us come to our feet. beast verse 20 was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in the presence of the people and fooled them by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast we ain't going to get into that today and those who worshiped him the, here's the point you're either going to worship Jesus or you're going to worship the Satan I wish I can say there's an in between spot a feel-good spot. You know, I just, God knows, God understands, and as the world would often tell you, God is love. God is holy. 
I said, God is holy. God is holy. He cannot be deceived. You cannot fool him. You're either with the program or you're not. You're either going to be with the ones who watch him come down or you're going to be part of the ones coming down with him. But it is a choice that we have to make while we're here alive on this earth. Verse 20, then the beast was captured and within the false prophet and so on. Those that worship him. These were cast alive into the lake of fire. And the rest were killed in the sword which proceeded out of the mouth of Jesus. The one who sat on the horse. Revelation 17, 14 says, they will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him those who are with him those who are with how many are with him today they're called chosen and faithful those that are with him so don't settle for what the world is offering you don't settle for what the world system is offering you don't settle for what everybody else is doing. You are chosen. You are called. You are part of his kingdom. And if we're part of his kingdom, we ought to be different. Because we represent another kingdom. I am a proud Puerto Rican. I am very proud. I served 20 years in the military to be called an American. But I'm more proud today to call you my brother and my sister and to say that we're part of His kingdom and that our prayer is Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The end of the day that's what's most important is the kingdoms of the world will fall but his kingdom is eternal so in conclusion we have explored today how Nebuchadnezzar's dream revealed to Daniel reminds us of the frailty of earthly empires in the face of the powerful sovereignty of your and my God in a world where everything seems unstable we find comfort, security, and the promise that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will raise up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. This is our desire. This is our hope to be part of that eternal kingdom of Christ, the eternal rock. And as we navigate the uncertainties of life, it is essential that we remember where our true confidence lies not in world human systems which will eventually fail but in the rock that will never move that will never give way and just as the stone that was cut without the hands struck the statue and crumbled it Christ our Savior will defeat every power that opposes his kingdom People looked at us Christians as weak, frail, insignificant, stupid, dumb. We're not hip, we're not in, we're not with the program. But the Bible tells me who wins, who loses. In fact, the Bible says, he that builds on the stone is a wise man. But he that builds on the sand is a foolish man. Who you give your alliance to? Who tell me if you're a fool I know that sounds harsh I don't preach every often here so let me just get it out if you're a fool or you're wise so today as you bow your heads I invite you to reflect on your own life where or what are you building your future on what empires are you putting your trust in? 
What political system are you putting your trust in? It is a moment of decision. We can choose to live in anxiety and fear, or we can choose to follow Christ and hold on to his promises of eternal life and an eternal kingdom. I encourage you today to declare your intention to follow Jesus, surrendering to him everything that does not please him and preparing to live eternally with him in his kingdom. Remember, the last empire has already been established. And in the empire of God is the kingdom of justice, peace, and love. And when the rider of the white horse returns, all who are in him will be called chosen and faithful. So let us lift our gazes to the eternal rock, trusting that his kingdom will endure forever. Father, we stand before you. And we thank you for your word. It is you who said, Jesus, that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. These things are written so that we may believe. We see it in history unfold. Your faithfulness. And I thank you. And I pray that you touch everyone's heart tonight, this afternoon, excuse me. That we will all make a commitment to surrender our lives to Jesus. Being part of his kingdom forevermore. Everyone look up here. I'm about to make a calling and I'm about to finish. As I said in the beginning, Israel is the clock, the prophetic clock of God. Meaning, there's no will, and I'm going to say it just like I feel like saying it, there's no way in hell will Israel be destroyed. Because they have to be alive they have to be a nation. They have to be a witness to the horsemen coming down from heaven. To the one who was rejected by them as the Messiah. The Bible says they will look to him and see the one that was pierced and will then say, he was our Messiah. Therefore, there's no way in hell Israel will dis disappear. Through history, the devil has tried to exterminate them. God says, oh no, you can't. Because I prophetically said that when the horseman comes down, they have to be a witness. So I don't care what you do. I don't care how many rockets. I don't care how many uh, uh, United Nations resolutions. I don't care whatever anyone else says. They are the prophetic clock. And we ought to be praying for them. We ought to be praying for them. God is faithful. God is faithful. So if you might ask yourself, Pastor, what is Jesus coming to do? <laughs> I don't have time, but he's coming to reign. The Bible says he will put his feet on mount and the mountain will split in half and he will establish a kingdom that will never be moved and he will reign from Jerusalem. Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. establish a kingdom here on earth how many want to be part of his kingdom it starts with being part of his kingdom here and now because here and now it is a spiritual kingdom as we surrender our hearts to Jesus so bow your heads as I do this calling if there's anybody here today I know I've been a little long it's hard to squeeze all this information in a sermon. But I try to do it as much justice as I could. There's a lot more that can be said and I won't. But just look into your heart. If you know that you know that you know that you have not made Jesus Christ your Savior, and not only the Savior, the Lord of your life, I want you to think hard today after hearing a sermon like this. He said, you know what, Pastor? I want to commit my life to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to do that today. 
Maybe you've never done it. Or maybe you are someone who has done it in the past. You've backslid. Or maybe you're simply like I was for many years. A foot in and a foot out. Not totally committed. You won't make it if you're not totally committed. So this is a time to make a decision. To say I want to make Jesus my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And if that is you, at the count of three, knowing that everything I have said today is true, history has shown us it's true, and we're about to see the next chapter. If anybody says, that is me, Pastor, before I leave, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want you to count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Just raise your hand wherever you're at. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. God sees you. This has eternal repercussions or eternal benefits. Look hard into your life one more time. Look hard into your life one more time. Where do you want to spend your eternity? Because at the end of the day, we're all eternal beings. Where will we spend eternity? He's offering you his kingdom. He's offering you the opportunity to reign with him. That is amazing. Say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. If that is you, one more time, just raise your hand. If you want to be added to the group. Quickly, we're about to leave, but if you raise your hand, I want to pray with you. Because I think this is very significant, this is very important. Can you beat me right here at this red line up here in the front? Step out of your chair. Be a witness for God. Stand on your faith today. God bless you. Come. Give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the King of kings and Lord of Give your life to Jesus. Make him King. Make him Lord of your life. Come. Come forward at this time. If you're not even sure, this is very critical. If the trumpet sounds in the next minute, like the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, that means you winked and it's done. Jesus returns. And if you're not sure that you're going to be picked up by him, I ask you to come forward at this time. Make it sure. Confess him. Receive him. He looks at the covenant you're making now. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else wants to come forward now? Anyone else? Abba. Hey, come on. Come, come. Jesus loves you. He paid a price for your salvation. He died for your salvation. He took, oh, hallelujah. He was crucified for our salvation that we may partake of his kingdom forevermore. Anyone else? Anyone else says, Pastor, I'm not leaving here until I commit my life to Jesus right now. I'm not asking you to be perfect when you leave here today. I'm just saying, can you secure your salvation by making him Lord, by making him Savior? Come.